Hey guys, it's your girl Carrie, and as promised, today I will be sharing a more detailed overview of my mother's Some Bunny Loves You birthday tablescape. Um, we held a birthday dinner party for eight for my mom last week, and I thought I'd share some tips and tricks because this tablescape can be easily incorporated into an upcoming Easter or spring tablescape. So without further ado, let's get started. So you guys, you know I love to mix my analytical side with accounting and my creative side for entertaining. And the first place I always stop is the budget. So let's take a look at this budget for our birthday dinner party for eight. And it's a Somebody Loves Me theme. And I had a $200 budget. So let's look at our simplified budget breakdown. The first line item on my budget is a contingency. And basically that is taking 15 to 20% of your overall budget. So if my budget is $200, I like to do a 20% contingency. So I take $40 right away out of my budget and put that to the side. This is for emergencies, things that may pop up that I did not think of or did not account for in my overall budget so that when something comes up, I can actually have the funds here to pay for those things and not go over budget. So really what I am working with now is trying to complete my entire event on $160. Always take out cash for the budgeted amount of your event because that helps keep you on track. Um, as you're spending down, you'll see how much you have left. Now, for example, now if you, if, now, if it's not feasible to take out cash, for example, your event is in the thousands of dollars and you don't want to carry thousands of dollars of cash with you, I would set up a separate account or separate fund and withdraw down from that account so it can keep you accountable and you won't go over budget. So let's talk about my contingency. I budgeted 20% for contingencies, which was $40, and I ended up spending $34 of my contingency portion of the budget. Now, what blew my budget? Basically, the floral arrangement containers. When I found the inspiration for my floral arrangements, I realized I did not have a fish bowl. So I had to go out and purchase two fish bowls because I wanted them to flank either side of the edible arrangement um, centerpiece. And then I had to buy a few more bundles of baby's breath because I ran out of materials for the arrangement and that cost $10. And then I spent another $9 on purchasing some more silver polish because I ran out of silver polish while polishing my silver. So after um, I set aside for my contingency, I broke down my categories into the other major categories that make up my budget. And that is the, ca uh, the cake. I did not make the cake from scratch. I actually purchased it from a bakery and my floral arrangements and the main course. I always try to um, do something really nice for the main course and then fill in with the sides. So I account for that because that's typically the most expensive part of the meal. And then the other line item goes to all the other food and small uh, other things that I needed to pick up. And so that's my total budget there. As you can see in this particular budget, you don't see any line items for decor, and that's simply because I planned on using everything for this tablescape with things I already had in my home. Now that may not be realistic for some of you guys, but if you've been following me for a while, you guys know I have an extensive array of entertaining items, and I planned on taking advantage of that. So let's talk about our menu. Now, as you can see, our total menu cost came to $124, and that made up about 65% of our budget. So let's kind of take a look at um, the breakdown of the menu and how we can be a little bit more cost effective for those that may be on even a tighter budget. And 
the first item on our uh, menu is the appetizer. It's an interactive appetizer. It serves both as decor and as food. It's kind of like an edible arrangement. So that's the crudite platter. And that was $10 simply because I had some of their ingredients already at home. And that's another tip. Shop your home for ingredients that you already have so that you can incorporate those into your menu. So for the crudite platter, all I had to purchase was the large purple cabbage and some cream cheese for the dip. I used some of the carrots from the arrangement and some of the radishes from the arrangement um, to help decorate the platter. I've already had crackers on hand and I already had the red peppers on hand. So that was $10. And for the crudite platter, you can take that cabbage once the event is over, chop that down and use that in another meal. Now the strawberry and feta spinach salad, I just needed to purchase a container of strawberries and the actual dressing. I already had a large feta cheese um, container from Costco. You guys know I get that all the time and it lasts for months. And I already had a large uh, container of spinach left over from Costco. Now down to our Salmon Wellington, that cost us 30 bucks and again, there are no cutting corners here, but what you could do is choose a cheaper meat, a cheaper cut of meat. You don't have to do fish, you don't have to do salmon. You can do something like chicken or pork loin if pork is in your diet. Baked potatoes are very inexpensive. That was just $3 for a bag. I think it was a 10 pound bag of potatoes. Then we had the roasted maple glazed Brussels sprouts with bacon that was quite expensive if you look at that total that's $24 and again the reason it's so expensive is adding in the bacon you could nix the bacon and that will cut anywhere from six to twelve dollars off immediately depending on what type of baking you get and how expensive it is in your grocery stores and then the maple if you already have pure maple syrup at home, you wouldn't have to buy it. Um, but in my case, I had to buy the maple syrup or you could just nix the maple glaze. You won't have to use maple syrup. You can use maybe brown sugar or just regular syrup that you have on hand at home. So we're going to walk through the decor of this table. But as you can see, everything on this tablescape is a very neutral palette. It is pretty much void of any color and most all of our color came from the food and the florals. So here is tip number one, shop your home. So after I shop my home for all the pieces that I think I'm going to use on my table, I wash everything and then I just lay everything out piece by piece so I know what I'm working with. And when you're laying your items out, you want to think about the menu that you've created and you want to make sure that you have the proper utensils, the proper pieces, the proper serving pieces for every single thing that's going to be on your menu. And sometimes when you're thinking about your menu, you also can think about the serving pieces that you have so that you can make sure that what you're thinking about serving will actually fit on the platters that you have on hand and you won't have to purchase uh, anything. So let me share with you um, this affordable uh, tablescape decor and how the power of thrifting and shopping off season can lend you to having some beautiful items at a fraction of the cost. So as you all know, I shared these in a haul a while back, these beautiful vintage glasses that are making a huge comeback, especially in the um, you know, variety of colors that they have out there. I picked those up from the Goodwill and they range anywhere from 59 cents to $1. And these, you know, are different, but you can mix them in with each other and they coordinate. Then I used my silver wine glasses, but I did not use these for drinks. I actually used this as part of my centerpiece arrangement. I just stuck in a little bit of baby's breath and some additional kale, leftover kale uh, garnishment uh, to, you know, just uh, beef up my arrangement. And again, had these for years. You've seen them on other tablescapes used in other ways. Now down here, I have our clear glass butter dishes. 
and this is where we would actually put our butter and over here I actually have the butter knives that go with the containers we're going to put um, one of these at either end of the table and this vessel right here we're going to use for the pineapple pepper jelly that will go with the goat cheese balls appetizer now this serving piece right here is what we use to put our goat cheese balls with the pineapple pepper jelly on and I love 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 this set uh, my girl Melanie over at Living Luxuriously for Less, she gave me this for one, uh, one Christmas as a gift. And then we just set that there with the pepper jelly and the goat cheese balls. And that wasn't reflected on my menu because my sister actually bought that dish over. And down here we have these three little um, glass bowls from the Dollar Tree. Love these things. They come in a set of three. Now the Dollar Tree is $1.25, but I think these would be great for $1.25 as well. I've had these for years. And this is what I use these for this go around. You can use these for, you know, setting up when you're cooking to put different little um, ingredients in as you're cooking. But this go around, I use these for tray liners for my baked potato station. So I have this little bunny tray here. Which I thought was super cute it went in with our theme but as you can see on the bottom it says not uh, for food use so this is not food safe but you know very Carrie is going to turn it into a food safe dish so what I ended up doing is taking my little Dollar Tree bowls and slipping that down in each one of the sections and then now voila it is food safe and then I also had all of the pieces here. I had these little tongs here so that, you, so that you could pick up the bacon that was going to go on the baked potatoes and then all of these other smaller spoons to get the condiments for our little baked potato bar. Now you guys know my signature move on all my tablescapes is to incorporate um, some unique vintage silverware or serving pieces so that they can be conversation starters and I just absolutely just love mixing the old with the new even if I have to give it a new purpose. So let's first start off with our um, flatware for our main course. I decided to use a vintage um, fish and knife fork because we were having salmon wellington. Now as you can see, a fish fork actually has this little divot here, and in modern day use, we really don't need to use a fish knife because most of our fish that's served, at least here in America, is already probably deboned, skinned, the skin is off, and it's just ready to eat. So you don't need to maneuver and skin and, you know, eat as if you were eating an entire fish, like a whole fish with the head on it, as they did in the past and in other countries. But that's why that fish uh, knife is shaped that way. And they also have a corresponding fish fork that would go with your fish knife when you're dining. So if you should ever see either of these utensils at your place setting uh, on the table, you will know what they're for. And as you can see, I really love collecting vintage silver pieces. And this looks like it was engraved. It looks like it was a T or an F. And I did not put multiple forks and knives on the table for multiple courses because we were just eating buffet style. No one was serving us. So we just used our fish and knife fork for all of the food that was being served. Next up, you might be wondering, hey, Carrie, what's that funny looking fork with that thick tine on the end? This right here, my friends, are our pastry or dessert forks. So after dinner's being served, we'll have our dessert. And in this case, we had carrot cake. And so this is what we're going to use that fork for, is for the carrot cake. Now you guys know that I am left-handed, so this fork really serves absolutely no purpose for me. But what it's intended for, I'm going to turn it this way. This is to help cut into those different crusts. Let's say you're having apple pie, creme brulee, or something like that. This little um, thick tine here helps with 
cutting and spearing your dessert. And that's at the top of the plate because this is what we'll be using after our meal for our dessert. And this one was also engraved. I cannot make out what that engraving is. So if you guys can figure that out, leave a comment below. I don't know if that's the letter E or if it's a J and an E combined, but I just really think it's nice and cool. It just adds a little historical element to your table. We've already talked about those implements. And this right here is just like a menu card holder, or you can also use it um, to uh, display the names of the different foods that you might be serving. So you would just stick your menu card in there and put that on the table. So guys, if you follow me on Instagram, you know I posted this funny looking uh, utensil and asked if you guys could guess what it was used for. I guess I can start posting these in my community tab on my YouTube channel as well. And so in case you didn't guess or you haven't watched my previous video, this here, my friends, is a baked potato uh, fork or baked potato server. And so basically how you use this, you would pick this up, stick it into your baked potato, lift it from the plate, and put it onto your plate. So this is a baked potato server, and we were using that for our baked potatoes. I just think that's really unique and cute. And you can also use this. It doesn't have to be just for baked potatoes. You can spear meat. Anything that you need to spear and pick up would work great um, with these. But I'm just giving you uh, the original purpose for what those were for. And here we have our berry spoon. And this, is, this was originally used to scoop berries, but I thought the bowl of this serving spoon was really deep and it was perfect to serve our maple glazed bacon br roasted Brussels sprouts. So we use this for serving the Brussels sprouts. And then over here we have our carving set and this was used for the um, salmon wellington to cut that. And then we have our cake servers there. And so here are all of our uh, place settings, items that we use to set up um, the plates. And all of these items were one dollar, a dollar each. Um, I shared this particular setup in a previous video that I did of various tablescapes that I'm going to put together this summer and spring. And my mother selected this one as her um, main choice. These were from Burlington for a dollar, and they're actually, actually platters that I used as chargers for the head table. And I use these little sage green plates as the dinner plate. And then I use this beautiful, um, you know, plate here as the salad and appetizer plate for the head table. These other items I picked up from Dollar Tree. Both of these plates are from Dollar Tree. This one here has the beaded detail got that several years ago so it's no longer available and this one here is just simply stunning love this got this several years ago as well from the dollar tree but it's from the better homes and gardens line i guess they had an overstock of that and then over here all of the place settings that were not at the head of the table received the wicker charger the dollar tree uh, beaded plate and the dollar tree gray plate and that was the setup for them and again, I like to mix and match. And the reason everything looks pretty pulled together is because I'm picking up the gray in the little gray distressed detail um, from this plate. So that kind of like all coordinates and then just using plain white. So that all goes together. Don't be afraid to mix and match. Now this piece right here was my jumping off point when I was coming up with my theme. Absolutely love, love, love this bunny. I've had it for several years and I knew I wanted to do a sophisticated, casual, elegance um, garden theme. Kind of like, how do you say garden without saying garden? And this was the perfect element because, you know, the bunny, spring is in the air. So this is kind of like a sophisticated bunny type garden. And that's what this piece was going to use, be used for. I knew this was going to be my centerpiece. I knew that I wanted to put a purple cabbage in here, cut out the center and put a dip in there and make this my edible arrangement. So everything else was kind of built off that. So I knew I needed a 
platter to put all of the, you know, extra condiments and things like that for the um, dip. So what I did was I took one of my vintage cake plates that I picked up years ago, lined that with the kale, and then I put all of the carrots and crackers and everything like that on the platter. Then here I just plopped in my cabbage, and here's a quick tip. In order to get the perfect size cabbage or anything that you're looking for that you need to use a vessel on your table for, take that with you when you go grocery shopping. So when I went grocery shopping, I was able to drop in different size uh, cabbages into the bowl to see what actually fit so I could get the perfect fit. And then once I got this uh, portion of the centerpiece nailed down, the table is rather large, so I knew I needed something to flank on either end of my edible arrangement centerpiece. And that's when I Googled vegetable floral arrangements because I wanted to keep in with that garden theme. I wanted to bring in foods that, you know, bunnies would eat, lettuce, carrots, radishes, and things like that. I know many of you had asked me, hey Carrie, do a video on how you made the floral arrangement. Actually, I'm going to leave the link that I saw, the video that I watched to make the floor arrangement. I'm going to give you a couple of tips that I think would be helpful because they were left out on that floor arrangement video and I had to figure these things out for myself. Okay, so here is tip number one. Similar to the tip that I gave about the cabbage and the bunny, Take your vessels with you to the supermarket so that you can measure and gauge what size um, carrots you need. Carrots come in so many different sizes. And also look for the petite carrots with the carrot tops because those will probably be the correct length that you need. And then also get them, um, get the organic ones that have not been cut because you want that like curly root. You want it to look as natural as possible. A lot of the ones that they chop the carrot uh, tops off and then they chop the bottoms off for easier, um, I guess, eating and, and, and cooking. You don't want that. You want it to look exactly like you plucked it from the ground. It gives it those little endings, you know, the root of the carrot gives it a little bit more of an elegant feel. Now, if you plan early enough, you can purchase floral picks online or you can check your floral store, but I had a hard time finding floral picks to stick my carrots and radishes and things like that into my floral foam and so I had to improvise and so if you cannot find floral picks you can improvise by using wooden skewers you would just cut them down to size so in the video when you watch how to make this floral arrangement when they're using the floral picks just use skewers and cut them down to size Another thing, in the video, they just share attaching the floor pick and sticking it into the floor foam. That did not work for me. The gravity of the carrots, it kept pulling away from the floor foam and falling down in the bowl. So what I ended up doing was filling the hole with hot glue and putting hot glue around the tip of my um, wooden skewer and then sticking it into the floor of foam and securing it that way. And that was perfect. Um, and that was a perfect way to hold the carrots in place. And also to cut cost, um, the backs of the arrangements are filled in with just baby's breath. And honestly, you can have a beautiful look just that way if you did the entire arrangement with baby's breath. And baby's breath is really inexpensive. Now this little platter here I thought would fit right in with the theme because we had this kind of antiquing handles, these antique silver handles going on. And as you can see, this kind of goes with this. But I'm always thinking about how things coordinate. So this kind of goes in with that vintagey antique silver. And as you can see, this also brings in some of that wood tone from the salad tray. And as you can see, the salad tray also has that antique type silver leg, our salad bowl, see? So I'm always kind of trying to 
pull all the elements together. So we have this little, you know, board here. And what I used this board for was our baked potato station. Back here in the back, I have this beautiful, um, you know, cake stand, a glass beaded cake stand, had it for years. And that's what we put our carrot cake on. And again, when I'm thinking of my theme, I'm bringing in everything. And how do I make this theme not feel like, you know, kitschy and just, you know, silly and kitty? I have adult elements, number one. This is a beautiful, elegant rabbit here. I don't overdo it with the rabbits. I have a rabbit there. And then I have this beautiful dish here. And then not only do I just use small elements of decor like the rabbit and things like that, I also incorporate it in the food items. So if I'm thinking of a garden, bunny, carrots, and all of those items, I'm thinking of taking that theme into my cake. And so that's why we had carrots cake for dessert and also my mother loves carrot cake that's one of her favorite cakes so I'm also keeping my guest of honor in mind what they like and also incorporating it into my theme is a large vintage serving tray silver tray that I have and it's you know kind of worn and beat up really love that it's not shined up and shiny and polished because again we're going with that antiqued worn um, silver look we're trying to bring a casual elegance theme to the mix and that's what we served our salmon wellington on we just kind of garnished the edges and plopped our salmon wellington right down in the center this little um serving piece right here it has the beading detail on it really like that because as you look through everything again it's subtle hints when you're you know when I'm pulling things together we have the subtle beading detail there we have the subtle beading detail here we have a subtle beading detail on my antique um, you know serving tray we have the beading on the glass we have the beading on our dishes so our motif is kind of like the beaded mixed with kind of like the vintage swirls and it combines the beading as well so everything looks cohesive and it really isn't like in your face so i really really love that so i'll pull this out for that very reason it kind of has that antique look plus also you know that silver antique look and we use these for our plates this piece was used for serving the cake i had the cake set up at the buffet and here we had our little uh, cake server and again it matches and coordinates with all of the vintage silver pieces so guys, I hope this video was helpful. I'm going to kind of cut it off right now because I feel like I've been talking forever, but I can go on for hours. There are so many other techniques, ideas, and things that I could just pick apart, apart and talk about and teach um, for this uh, tablescape that can be applied to any entertaining event. But I guess this is not the form, but let me know in the comments below if you would like uh, or would be interested in uh, participating in a master class for uh, entertaining, for home entertaining and setting your tables. And not necessarily just this style of table, but taking all the different types of elements and techniques that I know, dumping them into a master class and you guys practicing those uh, techniques and ideas. Well guys, until next time, I hope you at least learned something from this video and I hope you guys have a beautifully set spring tables or Easter tables and until next time, I'm going to keep calm and carry on. Bye guys.